Welcome BPC, my beloved congregation. This is the last Sunday of the year and the last year that I'm with you. Um, all these kind of lasts, ugh, but it is a great Sunday. Job says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's after the death of his whole family and the loss of his fortune. But the truth is the Lord takes away and the Lord gives. That's also true, no? and of course he takes away this year uh, and gives us a whole new one. So here's the trick about looking back. It's okay to look back, but don't go back. Look ahead, Jesus is out ahead. So you can look back, but don't go back. Step forward and follow Jesus. Keep in close contact with him. Let's worship as we sing, All Hail King Jesus. Father God, how wonderful to wake at five in the morning and listen to the cooing of the doves outside the window. How exciting it is to lie there in bed saying, I'm alive and it's a new day. How amazing to go for a walk and become aware of the Christmas beetles screeching in the trees. How satisfying it is to stand looking at a sunrise and feel the dawn's warmth gradually enveloping one. How refreshing to feel the breeze on one's face. That breeze that comes from who knows where and goes to no one knows but God. Yes, these are the things of God, your creations, Lord. And through these, we can know that you are wonderful and exciting and amazing and satisfying and refreshing. And yet, Lord, almost daily we see and hear things which many of us choose to rather ignore because we don't want to get involved, because it might waste some precious time, because maybe someone else might do it and then I can get on with my life, because the poor person in front of me looks dirty and disheveled from sleeping under a bush, Yes, Lord, these are also real things of God, which we often choose to ignore. Forgive us, Father, when we fail to feed the hungry. Forgive us when we fail to assist anywhere there is a need greater than our own. Forgive us when we feel a sense of panic and only hear our own reasoning and that not that of the Holy Spirit within us. Forgive us our sins, Father God, 
however small or great, so that we can freely take the hand of a beggar or an unbeliever or someone in need of God and show them that God is truly wonderful and exciting and amazing and satisfying and refreshing. Father, we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus and because we know you forgive our sins. Amen. down the year and pack it up and put it back to God. Let's say again what we believe, put that right at the center of our minds rather than what we've lost. And we're going to borrow the creed written by Jerry Snyder. It's short, snappy and just so helpful. Let's say it together. dead our faith, let's listen to the Word of God, firstly from Hebrews and then from Luke. I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 2, from verse 10 through to chapter 3, verse 1. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering both the one who makes men holy and those who are made, made holy are of the same family so jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers he says i shall declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation i will sing your praises and again 
I will put my trust in him. And again he says, Here am I, and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it's not the angels he held, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Therefore, holy brothers, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the Apostle and the High Priest, whom we confess. This is the Word of God. I'm reading from Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 52. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled for a whole day. Then they began looking for him among the relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother asked, said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxious searching for you. Why are you searching for me? He said, Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went home to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. May the Lord bless his word to us. Amen. Right, dear BPC, we've read the scriptures, two really beautiful, powerful scriptures, if you let them come to you. So this Sunday of the year, I always think is Low Sunday. Uh, officially, the Catholic Church and others think the Sunday after Easter is Low Sunday, because after the resurrection, everything seems a bit low. Uh, but uh, for me, who oh, tired at the end of this year. What a year it's been. My dear, what a year it's been. Um, I had this little jingle going in my head. I once was alive and appealing, but now I'm just appealing for help to get through today. <laughs> and I heard someone say to me, do you feel like some leftovers? And I said, yeah, that's exactly how I feel, like a used up leftover. <laughs> Welcome to Low Sunday. Hey, and if you're one of the preppy ones, one of those who are ready to go and you Got all your New Year's resolutions all sorted out, and you just can't wait for Christmas Eve, uh, New Year's Eve, and uh, the countdown to the New Year. Oh, shame. Oh, shame. Bless you too, hey? Some of us are actually in a different frame of mind on this last Sunday of the year. Not many preachers do well on this Sunday. It does feel like a bit of a drag, but. While I'm tempted to take the low road and uh, pamper you, I actually am appealing you to wake up and sit up and to turn your brains on and to focus on the scriptures that have been read to us and to let's really apply our mind to these scriptures set for us today. The Hebrews passage and the Luke passage. So we've read the passages and number one, Mary and Joseph did not understand what their son was saying. Luke chapter 2 verse 50. Even in those days, teenagers had their own kind of language. Jesus is 12 years old, man of 13. But Luke chapter 2 verse 51, it says, He went back to Nazareth and was obedient to them. Pause, think. Mary and Joseph were obedient to God in every way. But suddenly here we have the incarnate God, God in the flesh, being obedient to them. What 
humility our God has and how he identifies with us. Well, it was clear from the passage that Jesus knew that God was his Father. He knew God had called him, God had a call on his life and on his energy. Ah, I love it with new converts. When people first come to know the Lord and they first fall in love with the Lord and they first fill with the Holy Spirit, man, they are alive. They want to please God. Sometimes get up our noses. They have so insistence. They sometimes even make us feel guilty. But I just love that enthusiasm to please God. Hold on to the word enthusiasm and the phrase, please God. And I love it when teenagers return from a camp that they've been on and they've been filled with the Holy Spirit on the camp and they, they arrive back in them. It's just determined to put God, even if it's in a simplistic way, determined to put God first. Again, they sometimes make us feel uncomfortable, but man, they are full of God. Enthusiasm is just two little Greek words meaning God in us. Enthusiasm. In God. God in us. And folks, as tired as you may be at the end of the year, really the key to being strong in God is to be enthusiastic about life and enthusiastic about your obedience to God. Yeah. We don't have to get up on a hill and wave a flag, but from heart to heart to be enthusiastic. Please do not confuse worldly maturity with spiritual maturity. And please do not confuse spiritual immaturity with worldly wisdom. Don't, don't confuse these two things. It's quite often that people who are spiritually mature, even teenagers, have little time for social niceties. Worldly wisdom often can show a spiritual immaturity and spiritual maturity can often make people really irritable with social niceties. So I'm saying that spiritually mature people can be quite intolerant of worldly wisdom. And sometimes we call them naive in their, in their faith. Well, I'm asking you today as this year closes out, to put God first. It's a very difficult thing to do. To put God first at any at any time and certainly to put him first all the time. So let's listen to these two passages uh, again. Uh, let me run through them in some way and see if we what we can glean from them to help us, uh, inspire us. Jesus is no longer a child. He's not totally dependent on them as parents, Mary and Joseph, but he's not totally independent of them. He's a boy man. He's a man boy. But the Spirit has seized his mind. There's no doubt about it. And he, 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 Luke, as he writes, this, tells us that the first tussle between Jesus and his parents is about allegiance to God. It's about how they all see the role of the Heavenly Father. How they all see the introduction of God into our lives. So Jesus asked his parents, why were you searching for me? Luke 2, 49. Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? Verse 50, they didn't understand him. Oh, how often don't we understand people who are on fire for God? And verse 51, he went back with them to Nazareth and was obedient to them. I want to tell all people, especially parents of teenagers and young people who are on fire for God, you put God first as well. You be the example to the younger generation of putting God first. And please, BBC and anyone who's watching this, put aside being moderately Christian. Learn to give and not to count the cost. Learn to fight and not to heed the wound. Learn to toil for God and not to seek for rest. Learn to labor in love and no asking for any reward. Perhaps, perhaps except hoping that you do God's will. And please learn to be intentionally Christian. It is hard. And I failed. I failed miserably. And my shame deepens when I think that, as with many ministers, 
people think I'm a nice guy. People think, well, he's got to be better than us. Well, I'll keep my sins to myself, but all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So a couple of years ago, I was moderator of our denomination, chief servant. I chose a theme for the two years of my office from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Make it our goal. We make it our goal to please Him. And alongside that, Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. Live a life worthy of your calling in Christ Jesus and please Him in every way. The key phrase in both those is please Him. We make it our goal to please Him. We live a life worthy of pleasing Him in every way. So how do we put Jesus first? How do we please Him in every way? How do we show our obedience to Him? Here's the answer. Listen carefully. It comes from Hebrews. We put Him first. We show our allegiance, our obedience to Him by learning to grow in obedience through suffering. We learn to grow in obedience through suffering. We learn to grow through our obedience to Him in suffering and through suffering. And has COVID not taught all the world this, this year? Let me think about that a bit more with you. I'm sure this raises a lot of questions in people's minds about why does God work this way? Why has He allowed this to be there? Why is there suffering of every kind you can think of? I'm asking you just to set aside those deep questions for a moment and to accept the human condition is suffering. Okay? Let me run through quickly Hebrews 2, to verse 10 to chapter 3, verse 1. We suffer in this world, that's a fact. It was fitting for the Son of God to suffer in order to save those who suffer. He became one of us. He felt, he knew exactly what we felt. And his suffering makes him perfect, the perfect Savior. Then we learn that he is holy and so we become holy. As he became like us, we become like him. And we learn he took on flesh and blood and died and killed the power of death in this way ending for us the fear of death so we can suffer knowing death's not the end. Specifically, we're told, he does not help angels. They don't need his help, but he helps us who are sufferers, flesh and blood sufferers, mental sufferers, spiritual sufferers. And he was like us. And so we see his mercy to us by suffering with us and for us and his faithfulness to God by giving up his glory and coming to suffer on our behalf. So he put God first and the Bible says he brought many to mercy and to holiness. He brought many to become the sons and daughters of God. He put God first and the result is we were saved. He suffered so that he can help us when we are tempted in every way. And so chapter 3 verse 1 says, fix your eyes on him. Fix your eyes on him. Yeah. So, folks, I'm, I'm asking you to, to get to chapter 3 verse 1 of Hebrews where it says, fix your eyes on Jesus. As we move forward and as we close the year down and move forward and it's going to be suffering somewhere along the way. Well, chapter 5, verse 9, just two chapters further on, puts this very simply. It says that God's Son learned obedience through suffering and became, therefore, the perfect source of our salvation. Whatever you think of that theologically, God came to us and restricted himself to be like one of us. And he learned obedience. In other words, he, he, he faced every issue we face and learned obedience. And sometimes he suffered because of it. I don't think just in the crucifixion. I think every time he overcame temptation, every time he was faced with someone that was problematic, every time he was faced with the questions of pain around him, 
That's chapter 5. He learned obedience through suffering. Chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 2 says, Fix your eyes. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy before him endured suffering and pain. Chapter 12, verse 3 says, Consider him who endured hardship so that you'll not grow faint and weary in your love. Chapter 12, verse 7 says, Endure hardship. Chapter 12, verse 12 says, Strengthen your feeble knees and your weaknesses. Oh, Again, I feel such a fraud having to speak these things from Hebrews when I know I battle with these things. And so many of you have suffered so much more than me. I feel in all these years of being a minister, I've grown fat in comfort. Many of you have suffered. Okay, I'm struggling here, trying to do my very best to say, put God first, please. Put God first to please him in every way you can. And I'm directing you to the example of Jesus himself and Paul himself to show obedience to God. And it comes via suffering. The toolkit of obedience includes a tool called suffering. He doesn't make us suffer, but we... we, we, we uh, become awake to the fact of this human condition of suffering when it comes to us in some real way. So I learned this many years ago and I pass it on to you yet again. It's from a man called Ern Baxter. God is more God is more intent on the production of character than the provision of comfort. Very slowly. God, our loving Father, is more intent on the production of our character than the provision of our comfort. The condition we live in includes suffering. And he's designed us with the ability to get through suffering by obedient endurance and discover how much closer we are to him and like him. I think that's all. I think that's enough. He does not deal deeply with people who want to be triflers. He doesn't teach people to swim who never get into the water and move away from the shallow end. So, as you say goodbye to this year, it's been a tough, horrible year. I hope you have grown in obedience and strength. Even if you feel completely exhausted, don't confuse your exhaustion with but you've grown closer to him. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Hey, roll on 2021. I'm tired. But I'm ready. I'm ready to follow the Lord Jesus wherever he may lead. It'll bring me closer to him. Maybe suffering. Maybe joy. But all ends in joy. God bless you. And thanks for listening so well. Um, sit back now as you reflect on the Word of God and let, let this lovely song by Paul Belosh called Your Name just wash over us. It's quite long, but don't rush. <laughs>
Our Father, God of mercy, compassion and love, you are refuge and strength. We pray for the sick and infected. God, heal and help. Sustain bodies and spirits. Contain the spirit of infection. For our vulnerable populations, protect our elderly and those suffering from chronic disease. Provide for the poor, the homeless, able to practice the protocols of social distancing in the shelter system protect them from disease for the young and strong god give them the necessary caution to keep them from unwittingly spreading this disease for our national provincial and municipal leaders and elected officials in all spheres of government lord guide and help them in the decisions they make regarding this pandemic for those in our scientific community working tirelessly to develop a vaccine for this new virus. For those in need of regular therapies and treatments that must now be postponed. God, help them to stay patient and positive. For pastors and church leaders faced with the challenges of social distancing. God, help them to creatively imagine how to pastor their congregants. For Christians in every neighborhood, community and city, may your Holy Spirit inspire us to pray, to give, to love, to serve and to proclaim the gospel that in the name of Jesus Christ may be glorified around the world.
for frontline healthcare workers, we thank you for the vocational call to serve us. We also pray, God, keep them safe and healthy, keep their families safe and healthy. Father God, we trust you are good and do good. Teach us to be your faithful people in this time of global crisis. Help us to follow in the footsteps of our faithful shepherd, Jesus, who laid down his life for the sake of love. Glorify his name as you equip us with everything needed for doing your will. Lord, we ask this not because we deserve it, but humbly ask it in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. Join me now as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing our last song of this last Sunday of the year. There is a Redeemer.
now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and your loved ones always. Amen. See you next year.